What is up, Podheads? Episode 74 of the Podio Slate Podcast coming at you right now. I am here, as always, with Anthony and Nate. How you boys doing tonight? Fantastic, gentlemen. 74. We were just talking about that, how this has absolutely flown by. And we'll probably be saying the same thing um, at episode 100 and 150 and 200. And I mean, you get it's kind of wild. We're close to closer to 100 than, you know, when this thing started. Like, wow, how are we? Almost, you know, it's 25 weeks away. That's before the year. The year's out. Yeah. Just another reminder of how old we've become is now we have a tally on podcast episode 74. We're getting keys early, but I'm stoked tonight to nerd out as always. That's why we do this. Yeah. Yeah, we've got uh, a little deep dive on Tools Lateralis, which, uh, you know, turned 20 back in May of this year. So we like doing the deep dives on the on the records that we grew up on, and this is certainly one of them. So, uh, yeah, excited to, to dive into that, which you will hear a little later in the episode. But first, we're, we're doing a little time travel again because – uh, last week when we talked about it, I said, you know, I might have seen Greg in person here and there. Well, I ended up seeing Greg in person, which was a blast. And I know I didn't tell you guys we were gonna, I was going to throw this out there, but uh, lots of fun meeting Greg in person, giving him a Potty of Slave hat. We drafted him into the Potty of Slave Hall of Fame. And uh, yeah, it was it was a blast to meet him, check out the Bourbon Brothers in person and uh, see the guy like in person. It was just so much fun. Hell yeah. And you got to see him shred in a different way. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like I'm sure he was money in the bank you know playing that just as he was back in the day with zebrahead right oh yeah yeah and i get to see elmo in person oh that's which right is a call, which is a call back to episode 64 go back and listen to our last episode with greg episode 64 wheel of touring uh he tells the story of how he get, he found elmo on stage at after he was done playing uh, with zebrahead and real big fish was on somebody threw elmo up on stage and he walked up to grab it And sure enough, he still has this Elmo 20 some odd years later. And it's real. I've seen them both. He had both Elmos on his amp uh, while playing on uh, July 25th, a few weeks back. Friggin' sweet, man. You know, what's really cool is you completely have shown everyone that simulation theory is indeed false because you met Greg. It's not just a virtual relationship. You now have met him in person, saw him perform. Yep. It's all coming full circle. He's not a figment of our imagination. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh man, he's not some guy we saw on the street. <laughs> we pretended it was Greg. Yeah, yeah pretend to be Greg. So, did you lock him in for like a three episode deal? Yeah, he said he he enjoys he enjoys hanging out with us. Was for his words, and he said that in the last episode with us too. So it's out there. Like there are receipts, right. but <laughs> yeah, he's he's down. We got to come up with another. We'll come up with another fun topic to uh, have Greg talk about with us. I'm sure in the fairly near future. I bet. Hmm. Do we pitch it to Starbucks then? We might have to. That's not a bad idea. Great place to poop. <laughs> yes. The friend of the touring musician. <laughs> exactly. The friend of the touring musician. Place to poop, place to get your coffee. You, you, you need both in the morning every day. So. No, that's I, that that's badass that you 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 made that happen. And it's just, you know, we, we say this a lot, but like when we start the podcast, you don't think that shit's going to happen. You know, you wouldn't even oh, have God, cr- no. crossed your mind. No way. And it's just a, you know, you told 16-year-old you that that would happen 20 years later. You'd be like, well, that's fucking amazing. That's cool. That's fun. Well, and they say don't meet your heroes, but Greg, I mean, Greg's just a, a good dude. So, I, I mean, his wife was, was a blast, too. We had a lot of fun uh, hanging out with her. Their hotel in Savannah, ski ball and pinball in the lobby. Like, that's fucking wow. awesome. Okay. <laughs> we were doing that till like, 1.30 in the morning. Greg is really good at pinball. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> He's a pinball wizard. Yep, pretty much. And that coming coming from you, someone who's good with those games, uh, he must be good. Oh yeah, no, well, I mean hand eye coordination. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen oh, to the dude shred. Go. <laughs> He's got me there. He's probably better at Tetris than I am too, which would be saying something. Yeah. All right. So what do we got? We're not going to jump right into a tool. We have a couple headlines and themes here. We want to hit up. Uh, the first is live shows, live music, vaccination status. Nate, what do we got? Yeah. The landscape continues to change. Uh, Live music is coming back, which is obviously a really positive thing. Uh, But with that come different variations of adjustments, right? That comes from the venue, that comes from the participant, which is us, the fans, and also the talent or the act themselves. So Offspring uh, had to let go of their drummer. Did you guys get his name? I know he's not an an original member. Uh, He'd been, there was a a drummer, he's been there since 2007. It was Pete. Pete, okay. Pete Pete Parada. Yeah. Yeah, and he was let go from the band uh, because, from what I'm understanding, he didn't get the vaccine. Is that correct? 
Yeah, no, he the, that wasn't uh, in his uh, in his uh, wheelhouse. I guess he just wasn't going. He wasn't yeah. going to do it. And uh, Dexter Hot Sauce Committee. Uh, well, and no- noodles too. And noodles no- is pretty. Noodles is pretty liberal, and I—I I mean, I got vaccinated. I—I I am anti. I want to get the vaccine. I want people to get back to normal, and I think that's probably the—you know—not to get too political. Probably the best way for that to happen right now. But some people are anti, and it is what it is. And you're not going to change everybody's mind. I'm not going to try to do that here. As far as the music lens goes, this is what we're interested in, right? We're, we're worried about shows changing. We're worried about band lineups changing. We're worried about us not being able to maybe get into said show. Or maybe even a venue saying, nah, if you're not fully vaccinated as a band, we don't want you here. So, I mean, those things are all kind of on the table right now, right? Yeah, I, I still have a tough time with the with the venue denying the band because you could, you know, it all starts with booking agents and things like that. And, and they're going to say, yep, they're they're good. And for a ta- for talent who's on the stage, who's naturally going to be social distancing, money talks and they're not going to pursue that. So I don't think there'll be too much there. I can Probably see not. that. The interband yeah. dynamic, because I guess this this Pete guy had pre existing conditions, so I don't know the full story there, but that's neither here nor there. But that's a big step to do that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. If that continues to happen, then you're gonna divide your fan base. Well, losing members and then just yeah, you're right. You're having fans who if you've got a guy or, or a girl who's been in your band for however many years and all of a sudden you're parting ways because of political divides over vaccinations, like man, a lot of times I mean we've heard that in the past with different musicians. I'm not gonna name anybody in particular, but I know just like reading stuff over the course of time that some band members are anti some one thing and another band member is for it and they just kind of make it work. But this is one of those situations where it, it gets in the way of public health, possibly. So who knows who's on the right side there, but it's it's difficult. And I mean, I you're right. I don't think that we're gonna see we're gonna see venues say no to bands because it's their lifeblood. It's what gets the people in the door. I do think they're gonna say no to fans. I think that's we're seeing that in some places already. I think I sent you guys First Avenue in Minneapolis saying no to that so and we've seen other shows i think green day did it foo fighters have done it so there, there have been some uh vaccine friendly events where uh you know you're gonna get that instead of you can't come in if you haven't had both doses yet yeah i mean it's a devel- it's a developing story but also a lot of flus that just took place right in chicago mm-hmm. their protocol was basically show proof of vaccination and i actually read the details and it said a photo of the vaccination card is valid. So obviously that's very easy to fabricate. And I guess there was also scalpers selling fake vaccination card IDs. Wow. You know, that's a that's a new level. It's... Exactly. So it's, you know, the landscape has changed even with that. Not not scalping tickets, but a vaccination card to enter the festival is a whole different thing. But the whole band member change with offspring just gets me thinking like we don't because we don't get to see these contracts. We you know, we're not Ryan Senate, he doesn't get you know, to get to see those uh, contracts firsthand, like what does that mean for the band? Is it a insurance liability form? Did you check out these, you know, vaccinations? Are you tested for this, this, and this? If you're not, uh, you'll have to be to enter the, the grounds based on the fact that not only are we testing all attendees, but also bands equally. So, yeah, like you said, this could be the beginning of uh, a huge shift in how these events are going to uh, take place, whether it's just not doing the social distancing, but taking the precautions on the front end. Yeah. So Lollapalooza, did that just happen? Was, it, was that the festival yeah. that we, we saw all the footage from? Yeah. This, Online. The, for us now, a week plus ago, a week ago, roughly. But yeah, the, the end of July. End of July. I mean, there were shitloads of people. Like that so looked like, people. it looked like a throwback. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how it compared to previous festivals, but like to previous years of that festival. But man, there was, people were going for it. <laughs> yeah, they were. And actually, <laughs> tangent, I did see several videos of people digging up booze that they had bur- <laughs> buried on the ground. No way. And the who Grand knows? Park? Yeah, yeah. If who, who knows if it was actually like, I mean, I could do that in my backyard and say, I, look at me. I, I planted this at the <laughs> fairgrounds, you know, last week or whatever. But yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and and then we saw Fred Durst's dad vibes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what conspiracy theory that wasn't fred durst that was an andrew, <laughs> andrew wk thing going on where it's like <laughs> yeah. all right who are we gonna cast for 
for this tour. Actually, I did see a meme that was like, the dynamic in Limp Bizkit's so whacked that no one paid attention to Wes's wild outfit. Did you right? see that? Yeah, everybody's just like, oh, there's Wes being weird again. <laughs> yeah, everyone's desensitized with Wes's antics at this point. It's kind of awesome, though. Like, he's always got some crazy getup on. Like, good for him. It is cool. He does it all himself, too. That's the coolest part. It's like, you know, be in the dressing room doing it all himself, which is, yeah, different. If, you, if you're new to this podcast, uh, we are big... Uh, Limp Bizkit and Wes Borland fans like we've we've gone back and talked yeah. about Wes's other projects in the past too so yeah we're not we're not dissing him we think he's we think he's awesome he's a great guitarist too speaking of festivals um out here in California we got a little insight early which never happens um one of the founders of the festival festival for Coachella had leaked purposely that Rage Against the Machine and Travis Scott will be headlining the 2022 rendition of Coachella this coming year so that's pretty exciting Rage is obviously a big staple for Coachella's history. So house band for us too. So uh, house band. if you had if you had Rage Against the Machine being mentioned in the beginning, go ahead and drink. Uh yeah, uh that's it's early, you said, right? Like Coachella doesn't usually do this. Yeah, it's usually an official announcement from the organization and even bands, you know, everything's lip sealed. You can't say anything until it's full, you know, formally announced. So I was surprised to see this, but maybe it's just a tease the fact that it is in fact coming back plus rage like they had a pre-existing tour around those dates so if you were a nerd and kind of did your math you would under you you're not surprised i'm not surprised you know yeah. um travis scott's a different story um he i think he just got added for this rendition i thought i saw that there was also an announcement for 2023 too really oh yep it was one of the headliners for 2020 uh that got postponed to 2022 and now he's headlining 2023 exactly who that's actually my part of the reason too. Uh, I think it was Frank Ocean. Oh, okay. that's right. Yep. It was Frank Ocean. Yep. Jeez, that's. I don't know if that's that works for them or against them. I don't know because like if you don't like him, you're like, well, I'm not going that year. Or if you like him, you're like, yeah. ah, that's a long ways away. I won't get my tickets yet. You know. Yeah, it's it's April of April of 2022, and the other thing is like we, as we sit here in early August, mid August. We're thinking, where are we? Where are we going to be at coming out of the winter next spring? You know what I mean? Like, right. are we going to be going to live music, or is everything going to be shut down again? So, uh, it's it's an outdoor festival, right, Nate? It is. Yep. It's out in the yes, desert. May that may help uh, that happen, but with certain you know things, uh, certain guidelines and restrictions and whatnot. But yeah, uh, exciting that Rage is getting out there. I I wonder. I wonder, man. Are we are we going to get any new music from them? Because they, they are playing some big shows that we're going to play them this year, or 2020, uh, and now they're pushed to 2022 for a lot of it, but like Boston Calling and, and, and now Coachella, might we get a song or two? Like, that'd be fucking dope. I mean, you got to believe there's something there. Something. Like, all right, so they had those four albums, the one cover album, they had the soundtrack stuff. It can't just end there. And they had the what they have Live and Rare. There's no way yep. it ends there. And the last time they recorded was Renegades, right? Or at least on paper. Yeah. There's other stuff. There has to be. And they could do a greatest hits and, you know, like Stone Temple Pilots, greatest hits, throw a new song on. Yeah. In conjunction with this tour or with these shows or a new tour. Because aren't they going back with uh, Run the Jewels? Or is that a no-go? I don't know. I haven't seen anything on that. that. I mean, again, that'd be a dope show if they do and where Zach could do a little double duty because he does uh, he's featured on a handful of Run the Jewels songs he's the de facto third member so man I, I'd be I'd be really excited for new music but at the same time part of me is like don't what if it sucks don't take the legacy like, it's probably not going to but at the same time I'm, that's my like one one guy on my left shoulder saying yeah new rage give it to me and the one on the right saying no don't fuck with the legacy well, you could almost say that same thing with the live show. It's like I know I we know they're gonna bring it. Like it, it's actually yeah. not gonna happen. But like, what if they suck live? You know what I mean? That's the last taste you have in your mouth of them if you went. Yep. Uh, that's a good call. Yeah, Zach could like lose his voice mid tour, and it's just like all over, and you just watch, see him storm off stage. And you're like, "Fuck, Ray just broke up for the third time." <laughs> He's you're still angry, Zach. Jeez. <laughs> he is. I mean, go go listen to go listen to Brother Jules Four. Yeah, new material would be excellent. It just if I'm a betting man, I'm gonna say no. But realistically, they Same. probably have files on, upon files, notebooks on notebooks, even stuff they writ, you know, uh, wrote down like on a notepad like last year or even this year, just with everything going on politically and 
environmentally and everything. So, but will it, will it come to a full on album or even a song? Uh, it should. And will it? Uh, probably not. Which is it really is too bad, you know. But I mean, they would have been a great soundtrack. Not not great. I guess that's that's a poor choice of words. They would have fit twenty twenty with a yeah. lot of a lot of the political stuff that went on, a lot of the racial stuff that went on. They would have absolutely had something to say and said it really well. I'm sure. Uh, is it too late? Maybe, but soon that some of that stuff still happens. It's not. It's not like we solved it now that it's 2021. There's still problems every day, but man, they would have, they would have, I'm sure, knocked that out of the park as far as having a voice, uh, you know, voice of the voiceless, as it were. Oh, totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about like Coachella to me is just a whole different vibe. Like that's not rage. Like I can understand them wanting to get as many eyeballs and it's not for the money but like for their message as many eyeballs as possible but like Coachella's a fashion show Coachella's like mm-hmm. Instagram uh, that's what it's turned into you know what i mean i don't know it just there's no good seat there at the i know you're not sitting down but there's no good place to see the band it's so it's too many people yeah i mean i, I was going to say that you know they're from LA right so that's like the big festival in literally this whole state of california is Coachella's like the one but when it started i mean it it started with bands like Rage Against the Machine and and Tool for that matter kind of headlining this full on rock festival in the middle, middle of the desert so you know if you go down to the roots like they are part of the you know formation of this festival on the grassroots level but yeah I could totally agree I mean it's such a fashion thing now that H&M even has like it's Coachella line every season you know so it's weird very that it's changed huh it's weird that it's changed that it's gone yeah, it's from you know this this rock show in the desert to what it what it is today yeah, well, that's California. You know, it's still so cal. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the temperature, it's location. You know, I think it's it's in Cali. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it wouldn't if this was in Woodstock, New York. I don't, I don't think that that would happen. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, it came out a couple weeks ago, but have you guys watched the the Woodstock documentary yet? No, I have not. I haven't either, and I plan to. I, I just. Nate, you lived it, so I want to. I want to like. I want to hear your take on it after you've seen it because you were there. You know. Mm-hmm. I watched the trailer yeah. with my wife, and I'm like, I was there. She's like, she looked at me. I'm like, yeah, I didn't see these fires. I mean, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Is that you, Nate? What the hell? <laughs> I really, I really am just gonna stop it frame by frame and look for Nate. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. You were crowd That's surfing on the piece of plywood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I did crowd surf during during Rage Against the Machine at Woodstock '99. My brother thought that I died. That's the only <laughs> clue that I'll give for for now. <laughs> but you didn't, because you're here talking to us today about Rage Against the Machine. Go figure. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So Nate, are you going to this, the Coachella Festival? I'd like to. I don't know if I can pull it off, but I'd love to. If I if I can pull it off, it'd be excellent. Because I always wanted to see them at Coachella, because it is pretty cool out there. I mean, it's literally just the desert. And so it's loud and it's open and it's be- it's beautiful. And I've never been to Coachella, even though I've been on here for quite a while. So if I was going to go, this would be the one to check out. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We're all adults now. I got to pick and choose these days, unfortunately, or right. fortunately. Yeah, that's a commitment. I, I get that. It's mm-hmm. not like it's a one off in San Diego or Encinitas or wherever you're, you know, wherever you're at L.A. for the day. It's not like it's that. It's it's a legit commitment, as we've talked about on uh, our festival episode. So go check that out big money commitment too that's why i'm surprised about the headline uh the announcing the headline for 2023 uh, i mean i don't even know if they've opened tickets up yet but that's a lot to fork up for two years out you know yep. you don't know i don't yep. you know most people don't know where they're gonna live or right what, what their situation is gonna be but oh not to mention the world being <laughs> all over the place as it is to begin with yeah 2023 rage against the machine headlining fire festival <laughs> <laughs> hard uh, times headline or real <laughs> Uh, hard times, I think, <laughs> but could be real. All right, we want to we want to dig into lateralis. Yeah, an OG. Who's out business? Uh, I don't. A little band called Tool. 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 Yeah, I think Tool. they make racks for cars too. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> is it Tool or Thule? It's Thule. Oh, wait, this is the band that keeps beating Taylor Swift in the fucking Billboard ah, charts. Yes. Yes. Every time they drop a record, they pound at, they pound everybody. And the owner, he owns a winery, right? Or the front man yeah. owns a winery? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I know them. Yeah. And the album cover looks like a textbook 
<laughs> randomly. It's like, it what does. Uh, yeah. Like, what is know, this? As someone who went to school for that, it definitely does. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Tool, Lateralis, celebrated its 20th anniversary on May 15th uh, of this year. So it's now came up May 15th, 2001, which is kind of wild uh, that it's it's that old. Because it feels like they could have dropped it yesterday. It feels like they could have dropped it 25 years ago or 20 years from now. It's I think it's timeless. I think it's probably the progr- the best progressive rock uh, album of all time. Uh, it's man, there's just so many things we we could do a full episode on probably every song on here if we really wanted to. So we'll scratch the surface on some stuff. We'll definitely uh, nerd out on the stuff that we all love and you know go from there. But yeah. I mean, who wants to lead us up? What do we want to start with? We want to do uh, kind of our first thoughts on the album. Yeah, like where were you guys? Where were you guys when you first got this? Like, was this a you heard the single and you got into, it, or was this like you're dialed into Tool already, given the back catalog, and it was a day of type of thing? Do you guys remember? Yeah, for me, I remember I had heard the name and I've seen it on flyers and magazines. And I had Enema, no, my brother had Enema. And I remember always playing the song H over and over. Really liked that song. But I didn't fully understand the band at the time, I don't think. So when Schism came out, I was like, it kind of like that logo and that kind of like mysterious tool ethos that they don't really hold, say a whole lot with, you know, with what what's going on with the band or whatnot. So um, yeah, I kind of gravitated towards uh, Tool gradually, but um. I wasn't a big fan before this, so it was kind of a new era for me. Uh, Same. I actually didn't get into the band really heavily until probably like 04, 03, 04, before 10,000 Days. And uh, I I mean, I liked songs. I I liked um, liked Stink Fist. I liked stuff off Anima. Uh, and then when when Schism dropped and Lateralis dropped, and I was like, all right, these are cool songs. You'd hear them on the radio, which was kind of wild because they're both long. But yeah, they... They weren't when I was 17 when this came out. I wasn't like, oh man, I got to go to the store and get it. I wish I had been because I'm sure there's some cool promo shit that dropped with this that we you can't get your hands on anymore. But yeah, I, I uh, it took me a couple of years. It was really hanging out with our our mutual friends, Nate and Donnie, different, different Nate that kind of brought me into this world. Uh, you know, a perfect circle and tool and nine inch nails and that, kind of that realm well, it was through those guys and and. Yeah, 2004, 2005, I really, really got into this record. Yeah, I think probably similar, Nate, similar my kind of vibe with them. Like, I knew of them. I knew Sober. I mean, I think a lot of people knew Sober. I I never owned an album before this. This was my, I'd say, give or take introduction for full record. Uh, I remember getting it at Bull Moose. It was... Uh, it was not a. I don't think it was discounted. I think they knew what they could get for this album, and yeah. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into the artwork. But the the sl- and we actually, I think we talked about this on the al- album artwork episode that they had that plastic sleeve, right? Yep. Which, you know, a lot of bands wouldn't think of doing that. A lot of bands don't have the budget to do that. So that was kind of cool, and it drew you in. And I was fully on board with spending what thirteen ninety seven. But yeah, you couldn't escape uh, schism. You know, and that was the when I heard that, which I think came out pretty early in the release cycle, I was in. So I think we'll probably pause there. And are we gonna go uh, song by song? Is that how we're gonna we do can, this? Thing? Yeah, we can. We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the question for you guys. This is a nerd question. Do we want to go song by song the way that they released it, or song by song the way that the internet thinks it should have been in the holy gift, which is what the. Uh, reformatting of the album is you guys hear about that no i'm blowing, I've I'm never blowing heard your of mind this. right now i'm blowing your mind right now yes. conspiracy yeah. theory <laughs> so yeah there there's an internet there's all kinds of if you google tools holy gift you'll get this album in different sequence and it's based on the fibonacci sequence and the whole lateralis using fibonacci sequence that type of stuff i'm not gonna get too into it right this second we'll get there later probably but it's People say the album flows better. I'm not sure I agree. I've listened to it that way before. It's been a long time. But I'm also conditioned to listening to it, you know, with the grudge kicking it off. So, <laughs> and I mean, that's, man, we'll, we'll start there, right? Yeah. I, I, so just real quick, I, I'd never heard that. But after you saying that, 
after listening to this for the for the first time in a long time today, I think the sequence is jacked, just based on a few tracks and instrumental stuff that I think I would have put closer to the end. And mm-hmm. when we get to that, I'll kind of spill the beans on that. But the grudge, that's the first <laughs> opening track proper, fucking epic. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. that is uh, is that the opener in the Holy Grail version? No. Yeah, that's a mess. Yeah, right? I mean, the yeah, Grudge ha- is a this great, has to be the opener. great record opener. Like of any band, for any band. Yeah, it sets the tone. That beginning sound, I don't even know what it is. It's like op- it's like starting some kind of like electronic device or something. Machine, like, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, it's funny. I remember, do you guys remember, this was like out of the blue like a month ago. I texted you guys and I asked, I don't know if I asked your favorite track of this album or if I asked where the Grudge stacks up in their catalog. Because I remember- That sounds right, yeah. I remember putting this album on and being like, damn, I kind of forgot about this song. The the Grudge is an underrated Tool song. Like It's probably a, a half forgotten sometimes, too, which because of what's on this record and how big some of the other songs got with radio play and, and uh, it just conspiracy theory type things and talking about you know different uh, meanings behind time signatures and all that stuff, The Grudge gets lost in the in the mix there. And it shouldn't because it's... It might be like a top five tool song. Like it's just an amazing, amazing song from front to front to back. Yeah, it's insane. I wonder if it gets lost in the mix because it has a similar chord progression to Schism. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yep. So yep. I wonder if people just skip by it or they're like, oh, this sounds familiar to that. So I'm gonna keep scrolling because I don't know, attention span or whatever it is. But um, yeah, like you said, it sets the tone for the record. Everyone has their, you know, their shine on on that first song. You know, Maynard, obviously, but Danny coming in, Adam Jones, Justin, everyone gets like their their time right at like right at the beginning and it just unfolds. And then, yeah, I, I think it's a quintessential opening track for sure. Yep, it might be their best opening track on any record. And that's saying something. Well, is there also an element where like it's eight minutes long, eight plus as an opener and you're kind of like, all right, get me to the next song where people mm-hmm. might just maybe be conditioned to skip it? Mm hmm. That could happen with this, but it's so damn. It's not sleepy at all. No, I know. <laughs> like no, I don't think so. It's in your face from the jump. And I mean, May- we we'll talk about it a ton, I'm sure. But May- Maynard is next level there at the end when they're all kind of when they all come back together at the end, and he's just does that long ass scream. <laughs> just like, oh my god, man. It's and that, unbelievable. That, that's why this has to be. You're right. There's no filler, and it keeps your attention the whole time. That's why this has to be the opener. So the. The tool conspiracy theories, the Fibonacci sequence, guys. <laughs> I think you got this one wrong. This has got to yeah. be one. Yeah. Yeah. It just fits as an opener. I think it's it's their best their best opening track, probably of any. Not that there's a million records, but probably of any record. And that's, I mean, there's some good opening tracks in their catalog. Kind of, Vicarious is a great track. Yeah. It's 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 interesting. It's it's a great way to kick off a record that really, for songs that are what eight nine minutes long or like coupled pieces together like parable and parabola where you end up with 10 minutes or so of music and those two go together <laughs> for it to be as tight as it is blows me away like you, you can't how many bands can pull off eight minute song after eight minute song that, that are tight and don't really waste your time uh, yeah i can't think of any where it's that orchestrated you know and just the production on grudge where it's this build up and then dies down like lights down you know let's go to adam jones let him just kind of tool on the guitar for a little bit, just a mm-hmm. few licks, just to kind of ca- you know captivate the environment for a second. Like, yeah, I can't think of any other band that does you know nine minute tracks like you're saying, like this that just takes your attention away from everything else. Yep. So something you said, Tone, which is actually a pretty good segue into the second track, which is kind of no filler. I think Eon Blue Apocalypse is filler, and I think yeah. it's a, it's a it's a super interesting placement, and that's why. I gets back to my comment about I don't know if this is a fully cohesive album. I think the grudge still should be one, mm-hmm. but I think something like this would be better suited near the end of the record. Mm-hmm. And coming out of the grudge into something more upbeat like I don't know. Well, I th- yeah, I'll I'll save I'll save what I was going to say. Yeah, save that, save that. Yeah. But yeah, that uh, you're right. And this I mean, Tool does this. They have quote-unquote songs that are 
noise or you know some sort of noodling or they've recorded something and then they've pitched it way down and you know what i mean like they do that they do it again on this record it's coming up in a little bit oh yeah and i get that i get that that's part of their mystique and it's it does provide some ambience so i do think in this situation it does kind of it gives you a breath after how nuts the grudge was and yeah. you know leads you into the next song which that's why I think it kind of works here, but at the same time, I'm I'm with you. I think it, it would fit in other spots, and this might be a situation where, um, on the other the alternate version, there, it's a little later in the album. It's looks like nine, um, before mm. reflection. So, you know, it might fit better that way. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement that it's an interchangeable track. Although your point with the breather after a grudge is, like, great assessment, just because it is so intense, and you're like wow, that was, that was a lot, you know? And just like thinking about this song, Eon Blue Apocalypse, it, it really kind of like puts time at a standstill for a second. And I can't imagine, I can't think of anything else, but like a movie scene where it's just like panning in some kind of like war scene or something like that. You know what I mean? Like similar to like the song explosion, you know what I mean? The calm after the storm, like, holy shit, everything's yep. fucking blasted to pieces. You know, let's just take a breath here and collect ourselves. And I think that's what it is you know they're appropriately for with that said during the mastering of this album they actually dropped a lot of interlude tracks so there were there was actually more um but they cut the album with like two seconds to spare before it went over to mastering which was mastered yeah. in portland maine we would talk about before but um so they actually had to get rid of some other filler tracks so there's multiple eon flu apocalypses that existed and <laughs> yeah are in the bins in portland maine at gateway because uh i guess they cut quite a bit of quite a few of them do you think they did that so they could fit it on a record or a CD? Right, they had to, right? It's 77 minutes as it is. Yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. So 77 out of 79 minutes yeah. was the max from Volcano Records. They're like, yeah, you can't do more than that. And they're like, okay, we're going to, you know, tease you guys and do like, give you two seconds of the lead way. Yeah. Or two minutes. Yeah. So are you guys skipping this song when you listen back to it? Like, do you guys skip to? It's a minute. It depends. Depends on what I'm doing. I don't, but on um, this album, Similar to a Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, like, you know, this is a front to back album that you just play. And at least, you know, the way I listen to it lately is just like, all right, this is a full attention album. I'm not going to skip a track. I'm going to let this play through the way it's supposed to be. But interestingly enough, the vinyl version, right? You have this two tone that is out of sequence on the vinyl version because they couldn't fit the full track on one side. So they actually had to rearrange the tracks based on that alone. Yep. Size wise, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember playing this in my in my disc man back in the day. And of course at least for me, like when I had my big binder of CDs, I don't think I back Wait a then, second. Wait a second. Had you still have them. I do, but I <laughs> I mean this thing used to go everywhere with me. Yeah. From the car to the study hall. Not to study hall, all that. But like did the C D have I don't remember it didn't have the track list on it, did it? No. So I didn't know inside maybe, but not on the not on the back of the CD. Not on the yeah. So like I didn't I didn't know song titles. That's why like when I was looking through these today, I was like I don't remember Eon Blue Apocalypse at all. I think it just (laughs) I I probably thought it was part of the Grudge or or like part of the Patient. You know what I mean? Well, that's a good segue into the Patient. This is kind of the sleepier of the of the two obviously main tracks we've we've talked about so far. But I, I, it's melodic and it like it fits. It's, it's not my favorite track on the record. Don't get me wrong, but there are some cool like build up from each piece, yes. and they bring they bring each other. They do this on every song, but they all have their moments to shine. And Tool's always kind of done this, where at least since Lateralis, where one band member has done, kind of done their thing and been forefront, whether it be Maynard or Adam Jones or Danny Carey, whatever. And then another piece of the song, it'll be another band member, Justin Chancellor, et cetera. And then they'll kind of all weave those pieces back in together. And this song is a great example of that, I think. But it is sleepier. It's a little slower, but it's, it's an, you know, it's, I think it's one of their stronger tracks in general in their overall catalog. But uh, it doesn't have quite the bite that The Grudge does. Yeah, this is one of my favorite tracks on the album, to be honest. I always kind of go back to this one. Sometimes when I want to listen just to a singular tool track, I'll actually pull this number up because of everything you're saying, like that spotlight on each member, the fact they all come kind of come together towards the end. This is probably the song that changed my mind on production 
on an album because I was a snotty kid, like, oh, it's overproduced, whatever, you know, thinking I'm punk rock or whatever. To come to an album like this and realizing, okay, it's not overproduction, it's a ton of production, but it's extremely, you know, important and valid on a song like this or an album like this because without it, it would be, it would be a waste. It would be a mistake. So it, it needs that additional, you know, insight, oversight, whatever you want to call it. And that goes down to everything, down to like the vocal layering on Maynard. Like you can tell there's layering on the vocals and that would, as a snotty kid, you think, oh, it's overproduced. But you're like, well, it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, how does that translate in concert? Maybe it's a voice track. It doesn't really matter because it's it's the full art piece. That's the way it's supposed to come about. You know, it's like a big action movie. It's supposed to be right. over the top. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys, I think, in both fronts. Like this, it's I'd say it's the top probably three top three songs on this album. The build up at the beginning into when Maynard comes in is next level. Yeah. And I think this is probably top two to three songs vocally for him mm, on yeah. this album when it comes yeah. in. And Nate, you thought you made me think of a when you made me think of something when I was listening to this where it's like Tool isn't a band in the traditional sense. Like they're not a rock band, they're not a metal band. Like they're a band of musicians that, to be completely honest with you, they're just a couple degrees away if they wanted to, to flip the whole band thing on its head and be like a blue man group and be a Cirque yeah. du Soleil. Like have it be an all immersive experience because Maynard's like a maestro. I can almost mm. see it's like an orchestra. You know what I mean? It's just. I don't know. Listen to this album with your eyes closed. Forget everything you know about Tool and just picture it as this all-encompassing experience. I think they could do it. I completely agree with you, and I was I thought you might say, before you said Blue Man Group, I thought you might say what I was thinking, and what I'm thinking is they could flip it on its head and be a jam band. Oh, totally. <laughs> oh, yeah. totally. They, I mean, they could pull that off, too. They are so fucking talented musically that they could do really anything that they wanted as a, as a four-piece. Like, they're just that good and they ended up going this route and it has some edge to it and whatever, but they could, they could totally pull off a Cirque du Soleil, like theatrical performance. I'm kind of surprised that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Maybe they don't want it. And that, that makes sense to me too, but they could totally be fish. You know what I mean? Totally. <laughs> they, could, they have the same level of fandom behind them that would follow them to the ends of the earth, no matter what they did. So it's the same idea. Well, and it's, it's, it's almost unfair to them to lump them in with any genre like yeah, yeah. you can't call them new metal imagine putting them against any new metal band we spoke about <laughs> yeah, last there aren't, couple there aren't many yeah it's just like it, it's a whole different world and uh it's just unique and it's a testament to them it's all positive yeah i think circuit de soleil is a great example because it's next level it's you know expanding the capabilities of of humans you know like this is actually how far you can go like tool and this album in particular is a clinic for how it's done you know if you want to be a drummer listen to this album as your bible and you can probably become a pretty good drummer just based on learning these songs you know so i think that's a great comparison because it's not just a normal play it's not just a normal you know you know broadway show circuit de soleil is athleticism on another level almost beyond olympic level you know it's it's yep. repeated on a weekly basis you're going on tour it's a production it's a storyline um, it's one of a kind and tool is one of a kind. Uh, there's no Tool's other band. Absolutely. Like this. One of a kind. Yep. You're at that. Yeah. I was waiting for you to say it. I completely yeah. agree. There is no, nobody like them. I said that same thing to my wife tonight when listening to yeah. this, I was like, I'm putting tool on. I know you're not a huge fan, but just listen to here. Just listen to here. And she was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. Like I see this now, like this makes more sense to me because I broke it down on a nerd level. And I was like, nobody else can do this. This is the only yeah. band in the world that could fucking pull this off. Well, I mean, to double down on that, I, I, there's not a lot of bands that could cover them in terms of, I know that you're not going to cover Maynard's vocals, but even pull off what they do, but then you get a factor in that they actually wrote that, you know what I mean? So that it's two things going on. Man, yeah. we're, 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 we're geeking here, guys. Mantra. Yeah, we're only three, we're only three songs <laughs> in. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to put the next two together because they are together, right? Yeah. Mantra and Schism. It's Mantra's that kind of weird humpback whale underwater sound that you get right <laughs> like under, yeah. just, it, i can't i remember reading what it was i can't i don't know if you guys saw it it was a while ago now so i can't pull it up in my head but it's just this kind of weird drone and it happens for what i don't know a minute and a half or something it's maynard squeezing his cat is that what it is 
Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was something weird like that. Yeah. And it's that for a minute and a half or a minute 15 or whatever. And then into, uh, you know, those first couple of chords of schism, which I think this is another one of those kind of like, uh, kind of like Eon where, okay, the patient's over. We're flipping the script into the next little couplet. This is what you're going to get. Take a breath. And then here comes, you know, schism, which is fucking all time. So, yeah, it is all time. And I think, a lot of that kind of gets lost in the fact that it was a single. So when I listen back to this today, I, I tried to strip out, I tried to listen to it for the first time. And this song I has obviously has nothing to do with Bohemian Rhapsody, but it has that same effect where there's left and right turns that like you just don't realize when you're listening to it on the radio. Like put this in headphones and there's twists mm-hmm. and turns in this song yeah. that to think that someone chose to take the song in that direction. It's like, I wouldn't have done that, but that was fucking cool. Like, you know, <laughs> well, I, it's, and it's, a, it's an all time song. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's seven minutes. It was a single and it was played heavily. Like that yeah. doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen. And it has that weird music video. Cause tool music videos are weird. I watched a couple of those today just to kind of get the feeling for them. This is a love song. I've always said that. I don't know if you guys have ever heard it that way. No, but to me, no. to me, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like a love song, but I think it is. Or, or about how you keep love to working. Like you have to communicate. You have to be on the same page. You can't. It's not one person does one thing, one person does another. If you listen to some of the lyrics, it fits that for me. So, it again doesn't sound like a love song. <laughs> you know, it's it's pretty. It sounds pretty dark, and I think there's some dark moments to it for sure. But the other piece is the. Uh, uh, the, the time signature, right? It's it's a funky time signature, which is one of the couple of times they do that on this record because they can. Again, this goes back to Tool being one of a kind and being able to pull off stuff like this. It works. It, nobody else could do this. I don't think anybody else could do it to this level. It had to be a fucking radio single that kills. Yeah, you just said it. In particular, is the drums start to almost tr- not trail off, but they start to do it. Like Danny kind of goes in a different direction randomly, almost like midway through the song. And your brain kind of goes in this like, diabolic f- format it's like wait i don't know what's going on anymore like i was i was i was with the song and now it's tailing off in three different directions even though it's still one song so i mean it's just a mind trip one of a kind like you said all-time song i didn't think of the love thing but that just goes to show that maynard's lyrics are as deep as the instrumentals that you can kind of lose focus there's just so much going on even though it is cohesive in a song format but maynard's you know you know, lyrics are just as deep as Danny's drum fills. It's like, man, I'm going to have to listen to this a few times to fully understand what's going on here. And I almost like single out the rest. Was there a radio edit or was it played in full? I can't remember. I think it was played in full. That's crazy. I think it was like uh, when you get those classic rock stations that play November Rain, like it's a chance for them to go take a piss. The DJs to go take a piss. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's like what, almost seven minutes, right? And Is here's that? Stairway yeah. to Heaven, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna go take a piss. Yeah, I. Th- this is a song that holds up, you know, and a lot of songs that got that much play. And then this is by Spotify metrics. This is their biggest song. Is it really? Yeah, just oh, wow. barely hmm. over. Um, can I guess? You can guess. I'll I'll know when. I'm not sober. No, not sober. Hmm. Laterals. No. Hmm. Oh, stink fist. No, it's more. It's one of the more recent ones. Vicarious. Oh, the pot. Vicarious. Yep. Yeah, vicarious. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh no, the pot. I take that back. The pot. The pot's shorter. The pot was a single, and it was it was massive. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. That and makes it's sense. close. I mean, sober's right up there too, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, seven minute single that slaps the whole way through that still holds up twenty years later. It's pretty rare. Man. All right, another couplet. We're into the next. I think the next two go together, right? They're ten minute song essentially. It's it's parable and parabola, and the names would suggest that they're uh, they go together. And I think they they absolutely do because some of the lyrics are shared at the beginning of or the end of para, uh, parable into parabola. It gets used again, and it feels like okay, schism's over. Maybe that's about it was a love song that felt like it was things weren't going the right way. Now we're into kind of a more positive. This song is the most positive song on the record, a parabola yeah. anyway. It's it's very upbeat. It's very, you know, forward thinking, very third eye type stuff that you get with Tool. And 
it, I, I love this song. It goes back and forth between my second and my third favorite song on the record between this and the grudge. Uh, probably because of the positivity aspect. I just, it's so refreshing to hear them also pull that off after just pulling yeah. off schism, which was not as happy sounding. So yeah, I mean, great, great 10 minutes of music here. Yeah. They do the crescendo thing perfectly, right? It, you're captivated from the beginning. It's a buildup. It's a constant buildup and it just completely unfolds and you're there for the whole thing. Um, I think if anything, this song is the good behind the curtain look on how tool writes because these songs are kind of paired. Maybe they present these songs to Maynard in this format. And he, I think he reacts. He actually writes the lyrics to the yeah, song. Right? Right. Yep. So this is kind of a behind the curtain look at, okay, these songs are paired together. So imagine being in Maynard's position, having to write songs in a two part. Very interesting. It's like a musical. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know where this stacks up. I'd probably put it in my top five too. Yeah. Solid. I think on Parable, probably Maynard's best vocal performance on the album. It just shows his ability. And I think it's just like three minutes of bliss on Parabola. It's like the opposite end of the coin. Like it's, it's relentless and pause this episode, go to the four fifteen mark when Maynard and Danny just go tit for tat. I could listen to that all day. And I, I kept coming back to that when I was kind of ramping up for this episode. It's like, damn, it, it shows them at the peak of their powers. I think. And how long is this song? It was like six uh, minutes. If you put them together, it's ten. If you parabola itself is six, six oh four. Yeah, I mean, I think those are sequenced properly. To Nate's point, the crescendo, and I don't think any band does that natural crescendo as good. Not only across a whole song, but build up within a song. You know, yeah, yeah. and you yep. feel it. And there's obviously studio tricks in there, but like you almost look past that. Yeah. And I, I like your point earlier with, you know, like closing your eyes and listening to the album and kind of painting your own picture through the music. Cause it is, it's so illustrated when you want it to be, you know, cause it's, everything's there for it. All the paint, you know, all the colors are there to, to fill the picture. So these two tracks do that for you. And if you just, you know, focus on nothing but the songs, it'll, it'll take you on a journey for sure. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Nate, cause I know you'll, you'll know in my time of dying by Led Zeppelin. Oh yeah, yeah. You know the little noodle aspect at the end of Parabola. It's almost like the end of In My Time of Dying when it's like, "Oh, won't you take me?" And then you hear a cough in the background. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like it feels like that. They're just kind of noodling at the end, like, "Oh yeah, there's ten minutes of awesome," and uh, yeah, and we're just we're just fucking around in the studio, no big deal. It feels the same as that the end of that Zeppelin song. So oh man, great comparison. Listen to the end of both that. of those. It feels it feels like that. So pause this episode. Keep pausing this episode. You'll. I mean, this would be like a three hour. <laughs> this is this is how Spotify makes money. If they want to, they sign guys like us, and we talk about music that you can stay in app and go listen to from the episode. Oh wait, no, don't don't steal my idea. <laughs> Use our referral code on Amazon. Exactly. No, 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 not Amazon. Spotify. Well, Spotify. I guess Amazon. If Amazon. Jeff Bezos wants to give us some money too. Take me to space, bro. <laughs> I just want a bathroom break, man. <laughs> I just got to piss, bro. I just got to go to the bathroom. Oh, man. That was a tangent, ladies and gentlemen. All right, and so we're at the halfway yeah. point, so that's perfect. All right, listeners, what yeah. do DJs that play Schism and employees at Amazon have in common? They both want to take a piss. <laughs> they just need to take a piss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, can I transition to this one? Yes, and I have, I have yeah. something that I'm going to agree with you on if you don't say it, so go ahead. Ticks and Leeches... Favorite song on the album, last two minutes it goes so fucking hard. It's, yeah. I mean, you can't like listen to it without having a smile on your face. And if you don't, you're crazy. You know, <laughs> does that jive with uh, what you're gonna say? I what I was gonna say is this kind of goes along with your the sequencing is off because it's you know kind of upper downer upper downer, and this song is not not downer, but this song is a little more heavy and intense mm. than say. Parabola was a little more uplifting and lighthearted comparatively. This song's fucking awesome. The drums at the beginning of this song, I mean, I wrote, <laughs> I sent you guys a photo earlier in our group text before we started. The second line of my, you could see it, the second line was Danny for the win, always. This is it. Like, he just, he's my favorite drummer of all time. And these are, the reasons are songs like this. It's just so 
fucking intense from start to finish with no no let up even the breakdown you know it's coming so you're like oh shit like what am i about to get into and seeing it Nate, we saw it live i think they did it in boston yeah about 10 years ago when we went nice. down to that show and it was fucking wild then just to see that live and the, the fact that they can pull it off is this is a song that you you write in the studio and you don't know that you're going to be able to play it live ever they can do it no sweat yeah, speaking of that show or just the sequence thing you were mentioning earlier, this this is another song that actually would work as an opening track. I feel like um, it's got that intensity. But uh, man, Danny's drums on this. This song actually reminds me of a throwback to uh, Enema. I feel like this is yeah. kind of an Enema era type track. And uh, man, it really is just a fantastic song. It just captivates you completely. And it's just I don't know. I, that sequence thing just keeps boggling my mind because it's like, this would be a great opening track, but it's just a great track in general, so it doesn't have to be opening. Great opening show track, maybe. Right. But yeah, it's, it's Tool in their best form. He said it best, I think. Yeah, I, I was going to echo exactly what you said about it being a throwback track. Not only the sound, but the, na- the name of the, the song is something yeah. you would have seen on Undertow or Enema. Yep. Well, I mean, go back and listen to Jerk Off. Right, you guys know Jerk Off, so early early Tool song. Nope, I don't know. Okay, it, it's a precursor to this song. It's I think there's a live version on Opiate. Go back and check that out, because it's it's Maynard sounding super young, and then the drums are nuts, and yeah, great, kind of a precursor to what what they could do with a song like this. Like it's you can see where they're headed. Yeah, when you said the whole uh, in the in the recording studio, how are we gonna pull this off live? I was thinking in my head, like when you're like about to hit off the tee or on the pool table, and you know you got the shot. I feel like this is the song where they're in the studio, like, all right, we just we just we just nailed that track. Oh yeah. So I think we're all in agreement with <laughs> Texan and Leeches. Yeah. I, I think it's it could be my favorite, depending on the day of the week. It's top three on this album all day. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think I have it in the top three as well. But I mean, the next song. Oh man. Man, I I. Lateralis is probably it's my favorite Tool song by far, and it's probably a top five all time song for me. It hits every button I want it to hit on a song that I love. I listened to it tonight. I had uh, I had my couple speakers going at the same time on either side, so I could hear it from both sides. And every time I've listened to the song for the last twenty years, I've gotten chills every fucking time. I know where I'm gonna get them. It happens every time and there aren't there aren't many songs that you can say that about so man it's just it's it's there's so many weird things about it that are really cool that you you could deep dive on the fibonacci sequence the way that the lyrics are laid out the time signature is weird that's also a fibonacci sequence number go deep dive that stuff on the internet we're not going to get too deep into it here but it's it's pretty wild how they put the song together the attention to detail of this song we could talk about for an hour and a half easily uh and it's that type of stuff that always gets me excited finding those Easter eggs, listening to the song a million times, picking out a piece that I like that I didn't know was there the first time because it's nine minutes long. Man, it's perfection. It is the best tool song there is at me. I don't care. Yeah. No, the song is insanely, insanely good in every sense of the word. I think the way you described it is kind of what I was going to say is it's, it's so good that it's, you know, it makes your, you know, hair stand up on its end. So it's not really because it's such an amazing song. It's really because it's a feeling. The song is basically captivating a feeling. And it's like, if you like that feeling, you're going to like this song. But it's like, if you like certain, I keep, you know, relating it to movies because it's so captivating, like a really good scene in a movie that everyone agrees is one of the best scenes of all time. Like this song is that because it's captiv- captivating a, a feeling that you can only get you know, once in a while, once in a generation. And they, they did that with this song. And I'm not really sure how. seems like it must have been a pretty intense writing session to have everyone work together to come to this, you know, output. Yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's time warping in every, in every sense of the word. And uh, speaking of that sequence thing, I feel like this actually could work as a closing track just because it has kind yeah, of the yeah. pinnacle and it obviously it's the title track of the record. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think it is actually my favorite Tool song. I haven't thought about that in a while, but yeah, and I think everything you guys just mentioned doubles down on the fact that I don't think anyone else can do what they they do, and especially with this song. I think I 
I'll have to deep dive into the, the Fibonacci sequence aligning with, is it the lyrics or the beat or or both or what is both. it? Yeah, both. up and up and down from eight to uh, one to thirteen, and it, it's. I don't want to get too into the weeds on it, but yeah, the the lyrics, uh, the the syllables in each part of the verse, and uh, yeah, and then some some of the musical stuff too. That that stuff hurts my head, but the words I can hear and kind of understand a little better. Yep. Yeah, I would say that this ticks and leeches in schism are the top th- the top three standout tracks on this album for sure. The, I guess the other thing I would tell you is it it is another one of those kind of back and forth from negative to positive type feeling songs. I don't think this song feels negative at all. The closing spiral out, keep going, spiral out, keep going, I think is more positive than it sounds. If you listen to the, the record and read the read the lyrics and try to figure out what they're saying, uh, whereas like Ticks and Leeches is obviously a little more like fuck you, get off me type stuff. Yeah. I mean, Letter Ellis, this is like, I don't know if you guys, Tony, I think you know this, that one of my favorite songs of all time, I've actually titled it The Crown of My Favorite Songs is No Quarter by Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. This is like Tool's No Quarter. You know, it's it's a masterpiece. It's staple to the band. It's if you get to see this song live, like you've gotten your money's worth for the next, you know, 20 years, basically. Uh, it's just a bona fide masterpiece song. And obviously it's a title track for the album, but everything about it. And then we're such casual fans in terms of musicianship. Like, how do you play a guitar? That if you are someone like, you know, Greg or whoever to play the instrument, this just must be mind boggling to hear this stuff on right. a different level. You know, uh, it's funny. You mentioned no quarter by Led Zeppelin. They cover that on their live record, right? Salival yep. tool does. Yep. And then I they think with it at the Boston show. Yeah. And then there's yep. a, uh, there's another uh, perfect circle song. They cover when the levee breaks. It's mm-hmm. a very, it's a very stripped down and different version of that, but Maynard's obviously got some Zeppelin, Zeppelin love in his heart. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if there's any band in the history that's ever existed, if there's ever a band that had their whole career or whole album progression planned out from the jump, it would be these guys. Yep. <laughs> Where like it, it all like, it's almost like lost. Like the last se- the last episode's sp- supposed to pull it all together. You know what I mean? It just, I don't know. It's, it makes me wonder, are they done? Or is the last song that they put out uh, that, like, birds chirping shit that they did in the last <laughs> album? Oh, they just fucking with you on that, that point. <laughs> oh, I know they are, but, like, at the same time, like, maybe maybe we get more. Yeah, like, I mean, obviously, like, Coheed and, uh, Coheed and Cambria is not even in the fucking same ballpark, but, like, they have, they had, like, a whole storyline planned out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And yep. there's sequels and trilogies yeah. and things like that where... If there's any band that would have the full thing done and the full visual package known from the jump, it'd be uh, these guys. Yep. I think you're right. That's a good point. That's a good point because, you know, Zeppelin did that with one, two, three, but they didn't actually have the material written, I don't think. So maybe they're setting themselves up for that kind of accomplishment. Like, oh, shit, we have to. I mean, that's probably why it takes 10 years for them to write an album, right? They're like, oh, dude, it's not ready. <laughs> the sequel is not ready. <laughs> All right, Ref, uh, disposition, right? That's the next track. Yeah, slow song, really kind of subdued vocals. I, I feel like this was a skip back, back in the day. And like I said, I hadn't listened to this album in a while. I listened to it several times and I enjoyed it. But I think back in the day, it was a skip for me, and probably a good place near the end of the album. I agree. This feels like uh, intention on on Ten Thousand Days, kind of a similar later in the album, slower song that is awesome but feels like a come down from what you just had happen and i think intention happens after maybe lost keys play, uh, not lost keys um rosetta stoned mm, okay. uh, it, it's it's like this is after lateralis those two songs are similar in length you know lots of things going on and this is kind of a another come down but it's it's longer it's a little more of a jam there's some lyrics to it versus the stuff earlier in the album that's a minute long and just kind of sound. Yeah, that's why the jam band thing you said earlier makes sense because I think they kind of are a jam band. And then Maynard comes in and yep. at the end after doing 20 other projects and fills <laughs> in on the vocals, you know. But wow. basically they've been... Sl- slight Maynard dig there. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. Obviously, he's one of the best vocals of all time. But yeah, you know, I think this is one of those tracks where maybe this would have got cut had it been even longer on the front end. They would have to, you know, 
remove or cut this track down. But uh, sim- back, going back to the whole movie thing that I keep, I can't help but uh, avoid it in my head when I, when I listen, is this is kind of like the time lapse scene, you know, after the movie is like kind of coming towards the end and a reflection on the storyline up to this point, kind of like a time lapse scene with this uh, disposition kind of playing in the background to kind of tie it together, rounding out towards the end of the album. Not quite the end, but you're starting to understand the storyline a little bit more. Whether it was written that way or not, I have no idea, but that's what it seems like with this song. And then it segues into what I think should be the album closer in reflection. I, I don't know if the Conspiracy Theory Tool fans, if they had this at the end. Nope. Nope. Disposition they, is the last song. Which actually, Nate, that kind of vibes with what you just said, like the closing credits, the refl- reflection back. So that could work too. Another song where Maynard's wild on the vocals. like, And what is this, 11 minutes? Yeah, it's long. So do you think they go into a song in knowing where it's going to land minute-wise? Do we no. know that? No, I don't think they do. I think they occasionally will go into a song thinking they're going to have a long, you know, cohesive piece, and it may be seven, it may be 12. Uh, and then depending on how they want to break it down lyrically or do whatever with it, like they did with Parable and Parabola, okay, it's four minutes of this and then six minutes here or so. Same thing on uh, on 10,000 Days. Wings from Marie's part one and two are like, it's like 17 minutes total, but it's yeah. like six and then 11, you know what I mean? So I think they just write the music and it ends where it ends and they clean up what they want to clean up and kind of put together things how they want to. And then Maynard will write stuff around that. And then maybe they figure it out. I'd love to know. This is just speculation, obviously. And that's what yeah. we do yeah. here. But uh, I think, I do think they don't, they don't put a clock on it. They just go for it. I think it's way less intentional than we even th- remotely think it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think all these tracks are probably way longer, you know? Um, if, if you think yeah. about all these artists as writers, they're probably like, oh, yeah, well, I'm just writing, you know, books on books. And we have to cut it down to of hope, like eventually 11 and stuff, you know, 11 minutes, seven seconds for the song. But I mean, it was supposed to be 35 minutes based on Danny's part, my part and everything. And no one kind of having to cut down on their vision of the song. But, you know, because of the record label, we have to actually bring it down to 11 minutes. And that's the sacrifice. It's like for us, we're like, damn, <laughs> that's insane to think about. You know, Twan, interestingly enough, the only note I wrote for reflection is just a star that says Cirque du Soleil for this song. <laughs> really? <laughs> nice. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This would be a good so one. So I had that. that, I had that same vision, and I've had that vision a few times with this band and this album. Just like how it could be a full-on immersive experience in a theatrical uh, format, and I think they should do it because it should have been a movie. There should have been some kind of film accompanying this this film, uh, yeah. this album. Yeah, I agree with you there. Uh, the other thing with what you were just saying, as far as like the the music and and how that gets put together, it's no wonder that it takes them five years to. Not counting 10,000 days to Fear Inoculum. We're just talking prior to their long break in between albums. It was four, five, six years, depending on the year, depending on the album, between records, because it takes them that long to kind of put stuff together because they just will jam, 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 then finally hone down on it and then give it to their front man to write his lyrics and do whatever with it, you know, and then probably have to figure out stuff from there. So no wonder it takes – they're not a two years and then here's a new record. Well, the other variable is – it's 80 minutes worth of music. Some yeah. bands come in at half that. And I know this isn't the traditional verse chorus, you know, three minute song. So right, it's, it's right. tough to compare, but, but at the same time, I mean, what was the gap between the big gap there? 16 years or. Uh, yeah. Close to it. I mean, that's, Fifth, yeah, that, I mean, they weren't sitting idle. They all have other stuff going on, but I don't know. That's, it wasn't a priority. And again, maybe this goes back to their original plan. Like, all right, guys, here's our 16 year break. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thir- 13 years between 10,000 days, which was May of 06 and uh fear inoculum, which was late August, early September of, oh, of 19. Crazy. Yeah. Speaking of that kind of delay, like you think of masterminds and like, okay, it does take a long time to put up perfection, but if they were able to operate from uh fellow main idol uh or just legend stephen king and just you know get them out every fucking month i mean tool would be on fire and they could do it i feel like they they could pull it off and still exercise perfection but you know maybe it's time appropriate at all times i mean i don't know these songs the lyrics are different from what i think danny and adam and 
Justin are writing in their heads for what the song is supposed to mean. And then Maynard comes in and maybe changes it. And maybe that's another layer of complexity where it's like, that wasn't our vision verbally, but I guess you are the vocalists. And that's probably, you know, another five years go by just based on that conversation. Yeah, maybe. I mean, at the same time, like, maybe they're just like, this is what I do really well. And I jive with this other section of our band really well. And that's that's what they, they're they focused on. And sometimes I guess, you know, it takes six minutes to do. Sometimes it takes 17 minutes to do, but they do it. And they're just worried about that piece. And then Maynard comes in over the top. And it, it, I'd love to know. <laughs> right. We'd all love to know. know. Nobody, nobody knows. And that's part of the, the mystique. But it's also like, man, you guys have been around long enough. We've all been, you know, soaking this up. Give us, give us something. Let us know how this really worked. Yeah, Nate, I, if they were a traditional album cycle band, it would hit a little different because they're, by controlling the supply, they're increasing the demand and totally. Yeah, they wouldn't be, you know, flooding the box and beating Taylor Swift if they had a album every three years. I don't think so. Keeping people thirsty is is definitely helped them over the years. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I know it's such a kind of arguing with myself in my head about the whole thing, but it's like some uh, some books are so good in series of books like Lord of the Rings, for instance, stuff like that is like. It's so good, but there's so many of them. You know, maybe it was planned in like a proper sequence, but Tool, I feel like all, all the band members have so much to offer that they could continue to put out greatness, maybe not in such a um, mainstream and ultra time sensitive format, but definitely like a little bit more fast forward than what we've seen. But your point ultimately is is correct. You know, it's, it's so valuable for anything we get that it's it's priced because it's, you know, you know, it's gone through so many rigorous finish yeah. points to to have it go publish. So yeah, I don't know. All right, next next track, second to last one, triad. Yep. I feel like this could have been in the middle of the record as kind of a breaking up one half to the other, like the end of side one onto side two. You know what I mean? It feels like that palate cleanser type of song, but it's at the end, which is kind of weird. Yeah, and it it's almost like a noise rock. Yeah, like yep. track where you're right. It's like it's an intermission. It would yep. it wouldn't mm -hmm. be out of place as an intermission. Now, if it was, would you put it at the end of? You'd have to put it at the end of side A, right? Yeah, I'd put it at the end of probably after parabola, probably, mm -hmm. and then it, then it had to take some leeches to start side side B. That's just me. I I, I don't know if that. I mean, the conspiracy theorists, the holy gift, the holy gifters don't have that. They have it. Uh, it looks like eight. Shit, I said Coley Grail earlier. Sorry. Yeah, so I agree there. Triad, another instrumental track. This is another behind the curtains look, I feel like, on this track with the band presenting uh, Manor James Keenan with an instrumental track and maybe just look, for the most part letting it ride as a somewhat closing track. I mean, I mean, there's there's another track after this, I guess you'd say. But showcases again, right? Like their, their instrumental value and just like the tribal kind of you know soundscapes that come in towards the end of this album like no matter what that's going to translate to any live show so back to that circuit de soleil thing like this just like translate that translates there all day whatever you want to do with a live show like it's, at least this stuff will work there so yeah this is cool and so there's one more track which i'm gonna do you guys know how to pronounce it i'll, I'll butcher it faip de oyad would be my guess and it's a Enochian language. Did you guys see that? I, I looked that up. No. <laughs> I feel really smart. And uh, it means voice of no. God. Oh, wow. And it's not Rainer. It's somebody else. It's a like a voicemail from somebody. Yeah, I think um, I'm just, I would love to know the thought process of like, one, why they included this. Two, why at the end? Because it's, it's kind of a throwaway track. I mean, are you guys yeah. listening to this? When no. You, when you, no. <laughs> when you... No. But if you look it up, I think it's on there for you to look it up. Yeah, honestly, it, that's, you're, that's why you're it's probably there. right. Yep, it got yeah, it got you to look it up. You know. Yeah, it's a it's a voicemail from a, a someone who claims to be a former employee uh, of Area Fifty One, and they call into some conspiracy theorist show from nineteen ninety seven, so four years prior to the drop of the album, and. Uh, it's aliens related, and I mean I I don't know I, I don't want to read the whole thing I've got here, but that's it's it's for you to go look that up and to find out 
it's something that they must have known about and wanted to like put on the back end to, to mess with people and to make them think about something who knows <laughs> just you're right it'd be nice to know from them like why why add this why put this on the end but it's it made me go look it up and i was like okay this is weird and conspiracy theory type and there's a song about aliens on the next record so who knows i like that yeah. just, just the fact that they put it on for you to look it up like that brings new meaning to it to be honest with you for me but i'm not listening to it very often you know what right. i mean like it's not a song right i know it's there right <laughs> right it's one of those yeah, I listen to it now. I didn't listen to it then. Although the only time I did listen to it back then is when I think I fell asleep to the album. And you know how it there's like a few minutes of silence after Triad, and then this kind of creeps up. And it was like three in the morning, and this started playing, and I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" It was the first time I actually like heard it, so I was like, "Oh, this is still the fucking album." Okay, but yeah, a little unnecessary. But at the same time, like leaves after such an album that takes you on such a journey, like to end it with this is kind of like that back to the movie thing you know what i mean like man that movie was good it's a good way to close the movie and then at the end they kind of do a little cliffhanger like oh is there gonna be a sequel like you know what is this all oh, mean? i like that maybe the I like that whole yeah, story that makes sense yep yeah maybe the whole storyline is completely wrong and it's actually aliens or whatever i don't know but yeah it's a little freaky if it's real it's even cooler if it's a real voicemail I don't it's, know. A, it's it is it's it's from yeah. uh from some colin show that was done for years by some conspiracy conspiracy theorist named art bell Wow. It's, it claims to be from some guy from who worked for Area 51, and he says the disasters that are coming, they, the military, I'm sorry, the government knows about them. So go back and listen to our conspiracy theory episode about the music industry if you're, you're wanting some more of that. <laughs> wow. This would be a good one to ask Tom DeLong about this, this track. <laughs> Aliens exist, man. I mean, <laughs> hey. I actually, it it makes me want to go back and like try to listen to it again because at the same time I'm like, man, things have changed now. 2021 lens, we know that there's yeah. unidentified flying objects up there. Man, I I've always liked this album. I've owned it for 20 years, but um, I don't know when you take a step back from something from anything because I haven't listened to it front to back like this in many many years. When you take a step back from something and revisit it, it's, if it's something really good it brings a whole new appreciation and that's kind of where I'm at with this. I'm older. I've seen a lot of crap, you know, as far as music and albums over the years and you see a lot of artists getting big with no talent. And then you put this on and it's like, well, this is next level. I mean, I don't think there's any topping this from a musician standpoint, from a taking you on a journey just picking something up new every time you listen to it. It's like, with a, was that always there? It was just a remix, you know? Right. That's a great way to put yeah. it. It is, it is absolutely something that you can listen to today, yesterday, tomorrow, and find something brand new. And the fact that they were able to get four, these four people ended up in a band together to make great point all of this music the way that they've been able to make it over the years. But this, I think, being their probably best record front to back – it's wild that we, we have that. And then you have bands that not necessarily bigger, but big for different reasons. And they don't have, you know, a quarter of the talent. It's, <laughs> it's all studio wild. tracks or it's yeah, a catchy yeah. hook, you know, like it's crazy. Does this album have a chorus on it? Like <laughs> maybe, maybe schism, maybe, you yeah, know? maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. It sold, it went gold in its first week. Right. Well, that's wow. a different time too, but yeah, I mean, right. yeah. they that's probably true. would go gold yep. today if they put this out or close to it. Yep. Oh, easily. Yeah. We always talk about industry plants here. I'm like, this is like a universe plant. Like the universe, <laughs> like put all four of these people in crossroads to make this album happen. Like someone had to I do love it. That. In the universe. That's the a great call, like, Nate. <laughs> it's a universe plant. It was the aliens. Down man. to everything. Yeah. Down to everything. Down to the artwork. Alex Maybe they're all the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to tell us something, bro. Ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it could be played. They could have made this 35 years ago. They could have made this yesterday. They could have made this in 20 years, and it would still fit in their discography. It would fit in the grand scheme of this type of music. And and there, it is the best. It's one of the best hard rock slash prog rock albums of all time, if not the best. And that's I think that's saying something. I'm not a huge, huge prog rock fan, but they're definitely uh, the kings of that as far as that goes. And if you're listening and you're wondering why we didn't touch on the artwork, it's because we've already kind of done that with our yeah. album artwork episode, which is yeah. episode, it's True. I don't know oh. the number, but. 66, maybe. 
No, that was Senate. Uh, 65? I can't remember. 65, maybe. And we first time ever being we hit, stumped. We hit it pretty good <laughs> on that on that episode. Yeah, it, but it's it's perfect. It it fits it perfect. I love bands that don't put themselves front and center on the booklet on the cover. It's just like here's art. Don't worry about what we look like. Here's art, and it speaks mm-hmm. for itself. And wow. they cool. they they do that. Go see them live where Maynard's just staring at the the back of the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Or he's like in some weird costume. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like they don't, there they want go. nothing to do with that. They're, they're more about here. Here's the finished product, man. What an album. Yeah. Go spin it. Yeah. Go spin the craziest, it. the craziest thing too. just like throw back to when this album dropped. I did see them live on the soaring cycle on the second leg. So they came to Portland, but they came to Augusta Yep. Uh, for the second leg. And I went with my brother and it was like the Augusta civic center is pretty run down. And so for a band at, you know, this, you know, this massive in this album, that's this much of a masterpiece. You feel like that would be like a Gillette stadium show, no matter what, you know, uh, but it was an Augusta civic center show, not even sold out, just unbelievable. And then at the top of their, you know, top of their powers. Well, they always came to Maine yep. sometimes twice a tour. Yeah. Show. Like so- sometimes they'd come through on the, on the first leg and the second leg. Cause they, they liked it here. They, they knew there were fans here. I mean, they're fans everywhere, but they always found a way to make it to Maine, which is, you know, hats off to them. And even um, a perfect circle, too, you know? Yep, yep. They, totally. They, and I got to believe that's Maynard influence to some extent. Yeah, I think Danny, uh, there was a rumor of Danny having a house in Cape Elizabeth back in the day, oh, too. Wow. So there could be some of that. I'm not sure if that's true, but there's also a rumor of them being upstairs at Amigos, which is a dive bar in downtown Portland, after they uh, mastered 10,000 days, I think. Somebody said that they saw them upstairs at Amigos. So, wow, <laughs> who knows, that'd man? be amazing. They, awesome. Yeah, imagine stumbling into that place. I mean, this is going a little deep dive on on Portland, Maine, but it's an old kind of sort of Mexican bar, Mexican restaurant type bar, but it's not. It's just a dive bar with kind of a cool outdoor, and uh, you know the worst bathrooms in Portland at one point. And yeah, they're just upstairs hanging out, you know, drinking scotch or whatever they're drinking. And yeah, they just you know. They're one of the biggest bands in the world. Here they are. Oh, if you stumbled up there, they'd probably tell you to get the fuck out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Man, that was a lot of fun. That was a deep dive of all deep dives. I think this is a quintessential album that we'll always remember. The fact that we got to live it when it came out and reflect on it, like you said, 20 20 years later on a bonafide masterpiece is is quite something to live it, but also reflect on it as an older adult. You know, it's really cool. We'll do that again. Maybe not with that that uh, band, but we'll definitely do another deep dive like that again. Yep. Oh yeah. It'd be, it'd be tough to tough to top this one though. Yeah. True. Hit us on the socials uh, at Potty of Slave on Twitter and Instagram. Rate, like, subscribe. As we say uh, the last few times, tell a friend if you like what you, you're hearing, and you've got a music friend that would also like what you're hearing, what they're hearing. Toss it out to them. I mean, that's the way we get this thing going. That's the way we we grow grow the potty of slave family so yeah tell a friend yeah appreciate everyone tuning in and uh we'll see you next week and uh, if it's your first time check us out again thanks everyone peace potheads cheers everyone (laughs) 